This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group, the specialists in high risk and challenging filming and time lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction, and infrastructure projects nationwide. And we're live. Welcome to this week's Safer Than Your Average. On the show this week, we've got Andy. Andy, if you just want to come in and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Blair. Um, so my name is Andy Lewis. Um, born in sunny Middlesbrough, um, in the grim northeast. Uh, and I've been working in health and safety and risk management since about 2002. Um, yeah. Just a, a pretty normal, average person that saw some interesting stuff, I suppose. <laughs> so, can we go back to the start, Andy, if you tell us a bit about your background? Yeah, um, so like I said, I was um, born in Middlesbrough. Um, my old man used to work for British Steel. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he worked there all his career. So, he yeah. started off in the post room and then progressed through, retired when he was 60, so he took early retirement. Mm -hmm. My granddad was, uh, on my mum's side, my granddad was a brickie and ended up with industrial dermatitis, mm -hmm. so he took early retirement. And on my dad's side, my, my granddad um, served in the army mm -hmm. at the end of the Second World War, sort of like his national service, and, and ended up just working... Um, sort of like manual labour jobs and things like that. I, like I said, I wasn't, I went to school in, in Eston, um, which is just outside Middlesbrough. Wasn't particularly interested in school, to be honest. I think I, I found it boring. Um, yeah, and then just sort of, I think I decided at about the age of about nine or 10 that I didn't want to go into further education, let alone secondary school. Um, so, yeah, focused on the normal stuff, you know, sport and golf, football, cricket. Was absolutely useless at all of them, but loved playing them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was, I mean, just the normal, you know, mum and dad, you know, they got divorced when I was 15, 16. But, you know, I couldn't care less, you know, I, I had my mum and dad. Um, so, yeah, pretty lucky, like. Didn't didn't have a bad childhood, you know. Mm. It was just the normal run of the mill stuff, just just normal fun. And I think um, something that you know, I think my mum and dad had always instilled in me is that sort of level of curiosity and a little bit of cheekiness, so mm -hmm. like just a challenge. So obviously now that I work in health and safety and risk management, it's uh, can be a little bit detrimental sometimes, but. You know, you've still got to have your sense of humour, as you well know. Definitely, and that's one of the reasons I asked you to come on the show. I've seen some of your LinkedIn posts. They're absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I was sitting in stitches having a laugh at a couple of them a few weeks ago, and it uh, brightened up quite a, quite a dull day. So if we just move on a little bit then, Andy, tell us a bit about your first job. So um, I left school when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And I left with one GCSE, uh, dual award in science, which was a grade C. And I don't believe I actually turned up for any of my other exams. Uh, I just, like I said, I just, I had this, uh, the idea of I was going to go and do an apprenticeship mm -hmm. or, you know, do something. Um, so I started uh, working as an apprentice on, I think it was about 50 50 quid a week um, back in 1996. Mm -hmm. Engineering and metal fabrication and mm -hmm. construction. And I'd done that with uh, a company called Nita Training. Mm -hmm. And that was, they were based in sort of Stockton, so it was an hour on the bus. Um, and yeah, and I, and I was there probably about six or seven months. Um, and, I, and, you know, that's where I, I, I discovered these things called NVQs and, and this idea of, you know, you learn on the job, you're getting involved that way. And, and I can still remember there was, a, there was a guy called Paul Latham, and he was one of the instructors. 
Mm-hmm. And it's something that stuck with me all my life because he said, the first week's going to be boring as hell. This is all health and safety. And he was a, he was a fantastic instructor. Mm-hmm. He, I, he came from ICI or somewhere like that. And he was, he just, just made learning fun. And, um, and again, you know, when I've, when I've started getting involved in, in training and assessing and, and, and doing that type of stuff, that's, that's always something that I've tried to bring to the table is that element of fun. Because for me, if it's not fun, you're not going to learn properly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So tell us a little bit more about that then. Was it boring the sale the first week or was it, was it good? Did they jazz it up a bit for you? Uh, it was it was interesting because they started talking about all these big metal presses and drills and grinders and and as as a sixteen year old kid you're just like, oh, you know, my dad won't let me in the garage and play with spanners or, or a handheld drill. You guys are going to let me do this, um, and it was it was really interesting because I can remember them bringing in these really graphic photos of. of um, you know, the apprentices that go bad sort of thing and mm-hmm. saying, if, if you don't pay attention, this is what was going to happen. And, 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 and that wasn't that, that, that guy, Paul, Paul, that was an older guy who he worked in the stores mm-hmm. and he was the first data on site as well. So he, he was, um, he was a real character. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I don't think it was particularly boring. I just found it quite interesting that, you know, Someone who, you know, you blatantly see that this thing's revolving at X amount of thousand revs per minute and someone's decided to touch it. Um, and that was, that was interesting. Um, but yeah, look, I don't think it was particularly boring. I don't, at that time, it was just something that I had to do to start learning and to start trying to work towards a trade. Mm-hmm. And did you have any inclination at that point that that's what you would do later on for a career? No. No, I mean, at, at the age of 16, I was learning. I was, so basically all my, I worked um, a couple of different jobs um, out of, after the apprenticeship bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I was trying to get my, my private pilot's license. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, and I had a sort of, an idea that, you know, doing the, after, after a pretty short period of time, the, the idea of doing MVQs was, was for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really enjoyed it. But like I said, my, at that point in time, leading up to sort of like Christmas of 90, 96, it was all about trying to get my pilot's license and, and trying to escape Middlesbrough, to be honest. Mm-hmm. If you've ever been to Middlesbrough, you'll understand why. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. I get it. <coughs> it's that old joke, isn't it? How do you upset someone from Middlesbrough? Ask them the difference between Stockton and Middlesbrough. There's no difference to Roger mm. Opie. <laughs> I, mean, the, the I mean, the most offensive thing you can ever do for, for someone who's actually left Middlesbrough or Tayside is, is trying to get them to come back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, and, and I do, uh, I love the borough. I'll, you know, Middlesbrough will be, you know, I'll always be that, you know, slightly annoying teenage brat. <laughs> that everyone sort of has inside them, and it, it and it comes out every now and again. You know, I mean, I do feel sorry for my mates who live back in Tayside because, you know, they're they're still subjected to practical jokes to this day, um, mm. which probably isn't in line with being a safety and risk professional. But again, you know, it's calculated. <laughs> so, did you get your private pilot's license then, or how did that pan out for you? Yes, yeah, so um, I got my private pilot's license um, and it was just going down to Teesside Airport. So it was doing that on a, on a regular basis and, and I didn't really tell anyone that was, that was doing anything about mm-hmm. it. It was just something that I thought, you know, maybe, maybe one day there's an opportunity. Um, like I said, as, as someone who isn't an academic, um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I've always struggled with that idea of just an exam for the sake of it, um, especially if it wasn't interested, but sitting, sitting the basic aeronautical exams and, and things like that. And, you know, but I think doing the NVQs and going through that process, had, um, it set me up for success in a lot of ways. I really enjoyed, you know, and, and someone, I was talking to someone a couple of years ago and 
they were saying that the best thing you can ever do is that first solo flight. Mm -hmm. and, and I sort of looked at them and thought, that was the, one of the most scariest experiences that I've personally ever done. Like, but I, I sort of understand like that. It's that I've, I've done this. So yeah. I've, I've achieved something. Um, and then it's, it's really interesting, like, because, you know, you, you're up there and all of a sudden it's just, you know, it's just you and this, you know, thousand kilogram little Cessna thing with <laughs> flappy wings and you just think, mm. but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. And obviously like looking at flying and, and things like that, um, it's all about safety. Mm -hmm. And this probably sort of started pulling everything together um, at a really early age for shaping a bit of a career and, and, and my future. Yeah, yeah. So where did you go after that then? You got your private pilot's licence. Were you working in metal fabrication at that time? or had you? No, I, um, I decided, uh, so I, uh, I joined the RAF at 17. Um, mm -hmm. And done just over five years in the Royal Air Force. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, loved it. Loved my time there. W wasn't in a in an aviation capacity, but kept on flying, building the hours up, things like that. And then in two thousand and two, I found out I was type one diabetic, mm -hmm. and that just was possibly the worst thing ever to happen to me. You know. Um, mm -hmm. I really struggled with having to stop flying, stop, you know, trying to build a career in the Air Force and, mm -hmm. and left and started scratching my head wondering what now? What's next, yeah. Yeah. Um, a really, really tough one um, coming out of the back of that and having to lose something that you, you love doing as well as losing your occupation that you need to go and work out what you're going to do from there as well. That must have been pretty, pretty tough. Yeah, I mean, I suppose looking back, um, I could have went one or two ways. I could have went on a really big downward spiral and, and suffered with a lot of depression or anxiety and, and things like that. I think part of that is, you know, it's, again, it's, it's why I've been focused on, on safety and, and risk management is because that, that mental health side doesn't really get talked about. Yeah. Um, for me, it was, I was really lucky because I didn't have a, a massive support network of friends. I kept myself, you know, quite insular. And But I, the, the friends that I kept and my friends from back at home, the, the people I'm still in touch with now, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they were good. You know, the the, the idea of, yeah, well, could be worse sort of thing. You could be a Jordy. Um and that was the that was the running joke. And I, and the reason I swear that is because one of my mates is a Jordy. Um, brilliant, brilliant. I knew that was gonna come in somewhere. <laughs> well, they're laughing at the moment, I'm there in the Premier League and I think we got beat by Watford today, so yeah, yeah. Happy days. <laughs> so when you left the Air Force then transitioning back into civilian life after five years. What did you move on to do? Did you move straight into safety from there, or? So it was, it was, it was really lucky. I was doing like again, just sort of working. I was working anything, mm -hmm. um, and someone said, "Oh, you know, have you thought about risk management?" And mm -hmm. I was just like, "No, eh? nah." They said, um, "One of the local councils is is looking for someone to go around and do risk assessments." Mm -hmm. Do you, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and, and, being, you know, and, and, and still being relatively fit and, and not the, the 16 stone that I am now, um, I was still playing sport. So it was great. It was an excuse to go to watch sort of like high level cr club cricket or go and see some non-league football and, you know, go and do the risk assessments on the grounds and things like that. And and before you knew it, I was sort of just working for the council, doing that. Um, and it was really interesting as well because on the back of that, um, 
you know, but I, I met people and, and I got my, my football coach's qualification. So I was doing a little bit of that at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think there was that the dark side in me sort of enjoyed doing that risk assessment stuff and, mm -hmm. and being involved and, you know, thinking, oh, well, if an ambulance needs to get in here, how? So, you know, you just draw your little mud map on, on your risk assessment. And, and, it, and to start off with, it was, it was quite funny because I went back and I sort of looked at what had been done the previous year by the person. And, and it, was, it was exactly the same. It was just like someone had picked up a piece of paper. And so I think I might have had a little bit of, like, say that, that bent, that sort of curiosity uh, to think, what if? Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that's been shaped by, you know, the fact that, you know, I've been in the armed forces, I learned to fly, mm -hmm. that type of thing. You, you always sort of think, what's next? Um, and then from there, uh, I have a, I had a friend who was, um, he was working at Edinburgh Airport um, mm -hmm. with a, a transport and facilities and, you know, the, like a, a service provider. And okay. he said, oh, we need someone to come and do night work and, you know, be involved in, in safety and stuff like that do you want to come and have a chat? And I thought, well, you know, it's, it's not the Bahamas, but it's Edinburgh, you know, <laughs> it's, um, and I, I, you know, I've been up to Edinburgh and yep. um, beautiful city. Um, and I thought, you know, what, 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 what could possibly go wrong? Mm -hmm. I'll do this. Um, so, and, and that was around the time that, you know, I just met me, met my wife, Karen, who, um, so, you know, I was doing four days on, four days off, driving up one road, going back down, working nights. This idea of fatigue came into mind and it was just like you'd sort of get up at normal time on a Monday morning and drive up and get into the hotel and then work your night shift and then keep on going. And then before you knew it, you'd done your four days and it was seven o'clock on a Friday morning and you were driving back down thinking, oh, I'm a bit tired. Um, so yeah, and you know, I've done that for maybe three, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, really good, enjoyed it, learned loads. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, it got me involved, not only in the safety stuff, um, but you know, the, the operations side of it, the budget and the, mm -hmm. that, that's stood me in good stead as, as we've gone through the process and, and as I've grown sort of professionally through my career. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, um, got married in 2009 and um, decided that, you know, I probably should look for another job back in the Grim North. So my father-in-law had a, an electrical construction and contractors business mm -hmm. and we were just having a chat one day and he was saying, oh, you know, this, this ISO 9001 stuff, you know, and I was like, it's just a quality management system. You say, oh, yeah, but, you know, this. So I said, oh, I'll come and have a look. And there's this thing called 18,001, and we'll, and we'll bundle it all together. And so I went and joined him in, you know, 2010. And, yeah, started working on certification and, and going through that process. And uh, just, I mean, working with Sparkies is a different kettle of fish altogether oh yes um, you know and the, there's there's always the one there's always the one electrician that sort of he's given it this he's like oh i've only been electrocuted six times and you're just thinking don't tell me that <laughs> i don't want to know this um but yeah look i mean it was really interesting again um so i've I'd, I'd basically gone from sport to transport and so like being on the fringes of aviation, dealing with a lot of service providers to construction, mm -hmm. and dealing with sparkies. And mm -hmm. it was just like, this, this wasn't the career that I'd envisaged. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly thought by the time I was, I was 40, I'd be, you know, working for some swanky airline, flying all over the place, doing all the cool stuff. And yeah, I was approaching 30 and still in Middlesbrough. And I was just like, yeah, this this is exactly how I envision envisage my life, sort of thing. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. <coughs> what happened from there then? So the seventeenth of 
um, December mm -hmm. 2010. Uh, sorry, 17th of November 2010. Mm -hmm. My wife got a phone call. Mm -hmm. And it was, there's a job in Australia. Would you, uh, would you fancy an interview? Mm -hmm. And this is at 11 o'clock at night and, and, and Karen's looking at me and she's on the phone going, this is a wind up. You're behind this. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have the brains to think that big. And she was like, okay, yeah. So, you know, over the next couple of weeks, interviews, Skype, sort of um, calls, that type of stuff. And then on the, the start of December, mm -hmm. um, the liner up and said, can you start in, can you start in, um, on the 20th of March, I think it was, or the, some of the date, um, um, sorry, uh, 20th of January. And then she said, yeah, no problem. So, it was a case of, right, so we, we had a house. It was, what do we do? So we've literally got four and a half weeks to <laughs> but, get everything out of the house, do every car boot sale in the world, get rid of all the rubbish, decorate the house, find a tenant, move in with the father-in-law for a couple of weeks, see everyone that we really wanted to see and avoid everyone that we wanted to avoid before booking flights, getting on a plane and traveling halfway around to Australia, halfway around the world to Australia. And then in the back of my mind, all I was thinking is, this is literally the furthest place I can get from Middlesbrough before <laughs> I start coming back on myself. Um, and yeah, we've been here since the 13th of January, 2011. Um, it's been interesting, and, and I will say this, the day that we left the UK, I think we were the last flight to leave London Heathrow because they shut the runway because it was that cold. Mm -hmm. And we were wrapped up like we were going to the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. So I had, a ski, I had a spider ski jacket on, I had a jumper, I had two polo shirts. I was absolutely freezing. Um, Karen had this big sort of, like big thick woolly coat on the cheek, a winter coat. And um, it didn't dawn on us that we were going to Australia when it was summer. And and at not, not one point in that week leading up to leaving to Australia did I think, I'll have a look on the news and see what the weather's like. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so we land after 24 hours. So we stop off in Hong Kong, we flew down from Newcastle to London um london to hong kong hong kong into sydney and at, and again at that point in time that the, the only concern was how do i get my dog over mm -hmm. um <coughs> excuse me so it was just okay so we need to get the dog over this is what we have to do and we land in sydney and they were in the middle of a a heat wave you know there were there was a banana famine. It was so warm in Queensland that the crops of bananas had been decimated. Um, I think it was something like $39 for a kilo of bananas, so about 30 quid. Wow. Um, and I was thinking, oh, what if it's going to pay 30 pounds for a load of bananas? Like, <laughs> and much to my amazement, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd walk around the shops and supermarkets and they'll just be loading it up and I'm just thinking these guys must be mega rich or mega nuts <laughs> one or two. Um yeah so we landed it we landed at Sydney. We looked like we were going to you know Scott the Antarctic and that sort of thing. And I remember turning to Karen and just looking at her and obviously everyone's walking around in shorts and t-shirts and, and I just said any more bright ideas. <laughs> and, I think, and I think at that point like I mean, 24 hours with me is enough at the best of times. Um, but being in a confined space of an aircraft, you know, I think she was ready to throttle me. So I just sort of like took that big side step. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and then and then we got to, um, got to the the customs bit. So she's got a work visa, and I've got like um, uh, like a tourist entry visa and a transition visa. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And because Karen was born in um, in Stockton. Mm -hmm. um, so she goes through first and the passport and the guy just looks and he goes, there you go. Um, and he comes to me and he looks at, he looks at my passport and he looks at me and he just goes, do you know the last person from Middlesbrough that came to Australia, went to Hawaii and got stabbed in the back? And I went, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he just shook the passport, stamped it and went, have a nice day. <laughs> and I was like, mm. At that point, did you ever been to Australia? Sorry? Had you, had you ever been to Australia at that point before that? No. No, I think the only time I ever looked at Australia was at the Commonwealth Games, uh, the uh, the Olympics in 2000. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's, it, was, it was typical of, you know, Karen is very sort of, my, my wife is very, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. Everything is, she's, She's very, very clever and, and everything has to be planned and she, she needs to go, but she can't do the planning. Um, and and, and it, it, she's, she'll probably kill me when she, she hears me say this, but she's almost like that typical academic, you know, extremely intelligent, but it's that, the nuts and bolts and the doing. Um, and like I say, she, she, is, she is very, very clever. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, for the, I'll be honest, that is the reason why that I have pushed myself to do as much as I can with training and getting qualifications because I've always, you know, I've always felt that um, I, I never had the support at school. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't interested. Yeah. I didn't find, like I, said, like I said, you know, it was, it was boring. I wanted to do fun stuff in science and and make bands and like most kids. But then when you sit down and start doing English and maths and it's just like, oh, why am I, why am I learning about Shakespeare? The guy's got worse grammar than me. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, Karen's always driven me to, to do as much training as possible and, and think of alternative ways to get qualifications. And, and it goes back to the MVQ stuff, you know, she, when I first started doing the, the MBQ level three in health and safety, um, you know, it, it, basically she was me sounding board and I was like, does this read right? Does this, does this come across grammatically correct? And she was like, yeah, but I don't understand the word that you're saying. I was like, well, that's great because that's the sort of reaction I get when I'm on site. So don't worry about it. <coughs> um, so yeah, so um, started work. So another funny story I'll tell you is we were, um, we just got literally off the plane, jumped in a taxi. We were getting put up in a lovely hotel in North Sydney. We had a view of the Harbour Bridge and, and looking into the Harbour and we, we get into the hotel and, and, and I said to Karen, I said, I could murder a beer. And she said, go and get a pint. So in seven o'clock in the morning, half seven, not that, you know, everyone should go and have a beer at seven o'clock in the morning after a 24 hour flight. I just want to put that out there. It might not be the greatest thing to do. Um, so I walked to the bar and said, um, can I have a, a pint of lager, please, mate? And this tall, skinny Aussie guy goes, don't do pints. I said, all right, what have you got? He said, we've got middies or schooners. So in my mind, I'm thinking midi, so like maybe half a pint. And a schooner was what they called a pint. And I said, oh, and I sort of looked behind and, and Karen's doing the check-in thing. And I, thought, I said, oh, I said, give us, give us two schooners. And he said, what of? I said, lager. He said, we don't sell lager, we sell beer. And I'm thinking, it's a bit early for a pint of Tetley's or a Guinness. I said, what do you, he said, oh, I said, we call lager beer. And I thought, oh, here we go. I said, well, just give us a decent lager. And he picks up this, this little, and it was like a half glass. And I said, what's that? He said, it's a schooner. I said, I was expecting like a schooner boat, like a big thing. <laughs> and he went, no. I said, all right. I said, there's only two reasons why you'd have a, a glass that small. I said, the first one is, I said, the, the lag is absolutely disgusting. And that's all you can tolerate. 
or it gets gets warm really quick and it'll be like drinking with a southerner and he just went no it's just expensive <laughs> you were just like and um, it was the worst lager that I've ever tasted oh no there's this thing this thing called VB and it's disgusting <laughs> okay. um, yeah um, so we'd, we'd been in Australia for a couple of days obviously Cam, we'd landed on a Wednesday Cam was starting work on the um, on the Monday mm-hmm. um, I went and bought the I bought these SIM cards coming through the airport um, and literally it was Friday morning and my phone starts ringing and I'm thinking I haven't given me mobile to anyone and um, so I answered the phone and it's, uh, it's this, this English guy and he's going, he said, Andy Lewis. And I said, yeah. He said, my name's Jim. I've got a recruitment agency in North Sydney. Do you want to come and have a chat? And I said, I want to know if, do you know? He said, mate, he said, I get all the names of all the poms that come to Sydney. He said, he said, you, you, you keep me in business. And he said, so we, it was literally, it was about a 15, 20 minute walk to his office. And I said, oh yeah, look, I'll, I'll come over at nine o'clock. So walked over um, and he, he said, oh, he said, what do you do? I said, um, health and safety and risk management. And this guy just started laughing and not like, ha ha ha, very funny. He was almost rolling around on the floor in stitches and he just turned around and he said, Try and work out when you're going to die. And I said, what do you mean? He said, because your phone will ring for about 30 years after you're dead. So I'd give your SIM card to someone that you don't like. He said, health and safety (laughs) and risk management in Australia, he said, is non-existent. And I said, no, come on. He said, no, mate. He said, give it 10 years, he said, and you'll be thinking, what on earth have I done? Um... He said, look, there's, there's a couple of companies looking at the moment. He said, I can't help you. I don't really do health and safety. He said, well, here's a couple of jobs. Go and apply for them. So, um, yeah, sent three applications out, uh, got three interviews and, and, and said, oh, first one that offers me the job, I'm just going to take. I'd rather be working and looking than bored. Um, and started working for a, a, a telco um, business and there's this this thing in australia called the the national broadband network Mm -hmm. and it um it's the biggest waste of money in the world and i can remember (laughs) it's 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 so badly designed um you know it's the idea of um you know bim so building information modeling you know back in like i can i can remember the, the, one of the, the one of the prisons that I used to go to school in, um, I can remember them getting some work done, and there was a guy there who, who had this 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 thing, and he was sort of it looked like an etch sketch on steroids, and yeah. he was and he was he was obviously doing this building uh, modeling thing, and I was just like, hmm. and um, and I was like, hang on, this is this is this is. This should be done on, on, on every asset, on every building, on on everything. And um and yeah, there was there was nothing, you know, you you when you do um construct I mean, I remember working on one of the projects of when I was at Edinburgh and we were redoing one of the car parks and you know, getting all the asset locations and mm-hmm. and things like that, and you know, working out where the HV cables go and where the water and everything is, and and walking around on when they were doing the works and just seeing what was going on. And these things were accurate. Mm-hmm. And then in Australia, you've got these things called Dial Before Your Digs. And, you know, they could be in the suburb across the road. The, you know, the, it, it's really interesting. And one of the businesses that I was first working with, they were, they were putting it in this, this broadband network. And it was a Friday afternoon, and I had the golf clubs in the back of the car. And I thought, get away at 3 o'clock, get around to golfing, happy days. And I can remember driving to one of the golf courses that was quite local to where we lived and my mobile phone ringing. So I hit hands free. And um, it was 
my boss, a, a guy called Steve Romeo, who is, he's, you know, probably say one of three safety leaders in Australia. Um, and, and Steve said, oh, we've had an asset strike. Can you go to the site and have a look? And I said, yeah, no problem. So turns back around, goes to the office, goes out and gets onto the site. And there's a guy there with a directional driller and the fire brigade are there already. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, this is good. And the fire brigade are putting these blast screens up. And um, in, walk over and just introduce myself here. I'm Andy, health and safety, come to start the investigation. And this fiery turns around and he's got a cigarette in his mouth and he's lighting it. He said, they've just hit the high pressure gas main down there. But don't worry, there's too much oxygen in the air. <laughs> And I was just like, I said, um, I said, who's in charge? He said, me. Do you want a cigarette? <laughs> I'm good, mate. Um, <clears throat> and it was just like, I've stepped back in time. It was just like, in, in the back of my mind, I had the Fraggle Rock music playing. And it was just, you know, and, and, and don't get me wrong, like, uh, Australia is an amazing place and it's 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 beautiful and and there's a lot of really nice people here and it's such a diverse place but it's certainly a place where you come for the lifestyle it's where your career comes to die um and it's it's been really interesting but yeah look that that was my first i mean i had done some in, incident investigation um you know it's the usual thing that happens in warehouses, you know, people get over the fire extinguishers and they decide it'll be a good idea to propel themselves down and then they go flying into the racking and, you know, there's, there's the usual stuff. And, and it was at that point, I just thought, have I made the right life choice? Um, so yeah, so I was, I was with that business for a while and the, you know, helped them go through, ISO certification. There's a th there's a thing over here called federal safety accreditation, which is it's um, one of the biggest wastes of paper that you can ever do because all the government organisations say, oh, you've got to be federally accredited to apply for this this work, and you go, okay, but you know I can get eighteen thousand and one, which is sort of like a proxy international standard. Ah, oh, but it's not Australian. Okay. And so you, you go through the process, you jump through all the hoops. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these auditors that do the FSC audits are, um, are just really grumpy safety people waiting to retire. Um, so it doesn't give you, it, it, it's, it's not the experience that it should be going through an audit that adds value. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of one of the things that, what I jumped on. And I, I thought, you know, I actually enjoyed the audit and I actually enjoy the system side of as well as doing everything and, and maybe there's an opportunity for me to get involved in this um, so yeah so um went and worked started working with a, a another business that does broadcast infrastructure um mm -hmm. and they had a a national project so they were putting in it was right at the time where they were turning the analog tv off and they were putting in all the digital um, cells and receivers and, and everything like that <coughs> excuse me um and started working with them mm -hmm. and that was awesome because i got to travel every week I, I think i clocked up something like a million frequent flyers miles and uh -huh. you know i've still got frequent flyers miles from when i worked at that business that i'm trying to get rid of and you know i can't do anything at the moment i can't go anywhere yeah um but yeah um i just went all over Australia, I was going to um, Tasmania, and and that's an interesting place in itself. And it's just like, oh, you know, Tasmania is beautiful. And she's like, what do you do? And they're like, nothing. There's a whiskey bar, but it's only open on a Wednesday. <laughs> okay, but I'm I'm going to be here all week. Get a hire car and go for a drive. You can drive. You can drive up and down Tasmania in, in a day. And she's like, oh. I'll go back to the hotel. I'll do some work. Um, go to Melbourne a lot, you know, going to South Australia, Western Australia, um, 
Western Australia is like Little Britain. It's it's just full of Brits and South Africans who work in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, going up to Brisbane, um, Cairns, Darwin. I can remember the first time I went to Darwin, um, and it was like forty degrees, and it was it was November, and we were putting we were changing out these big Yagi antennas on in the middle of nowhere, and and I get there and. So just here to do an audit. And the first thing the guy done is he cracks open a beer and he goes, do you want one? Okay. <laughs> mate, mate, this is a dry site. And he just looked and he went, but I'm not on the site. <laughs> just, just, we need to have a conversation, but we'll do this later on sort of thing. Don't, don't break the plane like American football. Just don't, don't cross the end zone. Um, so yeah, it was, it was bizarre and, and it was, there was, again, I, I, were, I was lucky to work with some absolutely amazing people, mm -hmm. you know, that within that business, there was, there was some really good people from a, a project management perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know, guys from the, guys and girls from the UK, um, a lot of expats and yeah, that project was, was really interesting, you know, good getting involved in the certification, going through that process, being the lead, the lead auditor and, and, and doing all that stuff was, was really interesting. Um, you know, and the budgets that I was dealing with, like $50 million for a safety budget over a three year project. And it was just like, and, and yeah, and that, that was exactly the reaction that I got was wow. And then you realize how expensive that Australia is. Mm -hmm. So take hundred pounds for a pair of uh, Steelys. It's just like, and 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 I got I got like the 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 Argos equivalent, the Asda equivalent. I got a Kmart, and I just get these these twenty dollar steely boots because they're comfortable. Why would I go and spend that amount of money? But it's it's that culture of you know it's almost like that keeping up with the Kardashians. You've got to have the best thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so and and I can remember you know there was there was two people who. Um, who I won't name in case they watch this. Um, but one was the, the CFO and I, I just, I remember saying, I said, this is more money than I'll ever see in my lifetime. How, how do I deal with the budget? And he just laughed. He said, just look all the zeros off and pretend you're going shopping at Coles. That, that, that was his bit of advice. I said, but you're not the CFO. And he said, that's what I do. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was, <laughs> and it was just like, you've got to be kidding me. And he was like, no, nah, happy days. Um, so yeah, from there, um, I went and I got poached. I got approached by another business to, who worked in Telco um, to go and set up their, their safety systems. They were doing, uh, they were putting their own fiber in the ground to compete with the MBN. And I was there for 12 months and, and that was really good. And I thought, I'm a bit bored. So I started doing consulting. Mm -hmm. So I just registered with an ABN and got me insurances. And I thought, you know, I could look for a proper job, but do a bit of consulting on the side. And it just sort of snowballed. It just, I'd get little contractors ringing up going, I need a management plan for this. I need method statement for this, can you help me with the risk perception for this? I'm going through ISO certification, do you mind helping us? And so I'm doing that and, you know, working as, uh, I work with a business as a consultant um, to get them 18,001. And they, in Australia, um, they, had, they have this um, Australian New Zealand standard called 4801. Mm -hmm. And how it got how, how anyone decided that this was uh, a standard amazed me because it basically says, do you have a health and safety policy? Yes. Here's your certificate. It's, it's a shocker. Um, but, but they love it. And, and, and this was one of the things, I think Australia was one of the reasons why 45,000 of them got delayed because you had all these, these people in these leadership positions go, oh, you can't do that. It's un-Australian. 
you, you can't make us make us map to an international standard. So it was it was interesting going through that, and they were dealing with um, aviation and security and things like that. Um, and yeah, it was just it just kept on going from there. Um, I started looking at digital risk and and things like that, and I went and spent you know, twelve months with with a business that you know looked at putting a, a management system together, and it's almost like the, the head of like risk and product and that type of thing. And I was doing consulting at the same time. And they brought me in because I'd, I'd had some good knowledge around 45,000 a month. You know, I, was, I was the nerd that sort of, as soon as the draft standard came out, I was like, oh, let's have a look at this. And, you know, putting everything in place, again, looking at budgets and, and things like that. And uh, I'd made the decision I was I was just going to walk away from that business. It wasn't for me. It just, just didn't fit right. You know, there was... This idea of, of working with an organisation where Friday drinks and the, the HR people would ring you up and go, oh, we're having Friday drinks. I'm like, I don't want to go out for a beer with you. Oh, we're not going out. We're going to have it in the office. And it's just like, I drive into work. Yeah, but you can have a couple. And, and it was that mentality around, you know, it was just, it just didn't sort of gel right with me. I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm not a massively sociable person. Unless I'm within my my sort of like my little group, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and within my little group, there's there's Kiwis, there's South Africans, there's there's Germans, and there's a couple of French guys and, and Aussies, and you know, we're, we're all pretty, you know, slightly broken. I think is the best word, but we're all we're all slightly broken because of our careers. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the guys who work in procurement are far worse than anyone who works in health and safety. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so, <laughs> well, it, it, uh, you know, there's it was just really interesting. So going through and doing a bit of consulting, and then um, I've got a, I've got a couple of friends who were recruiters, and and I, I don't know how I even got associated with them because um, the, the they were they were as dull as dishwater. Um, but he rang us up, and he said. Um, I need a favour. And I said, all right, what? Thinking he was going to say his business needed certifying or, or something. He said, um, there's a, there's an opportunity going with this organisation. I said, right. And he said, I've, I've sort of promised him you'll go. I said, what? And he said, yeah. And I said, all right. I said, well, the money better be amazing. He said, yeah, it is. He said, it's pretty good. And you know when a recruiter says the money's good, you know, they're thinking I'm getting 10 or 15% of this. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I went and became the, the director of safety, risk and corporate compliance for a, a massive FMCG. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I can remember, you know, walking onto, onto the, one of the biggest warehouses that they've got in Sydney. And just looking, and I just went, why has no one got any steel toe cap boots on or safety footwear? And the operations manager turned around and went, ha, we've never had an incident. I said, all right. He said, well, we do safety differently. And I just looked at him and obviously you do safety very differently. You've got no safety systems. Um, and he was going, well, well, no, you know, we just, we have a conversation. I said, let me, let me open my laptop up and we'll have a look at your site performance. And their, their, their LTI rates were up in the twenties and thirties. The medically treated injuries were, were up in, you know, the forties. The, the triffa was, it was just like over the last, it was like a, a cardiogram. It was just all over the place. And I just went, you can't operate a site like this. And he went, yeah, but the last safety, um, the, the last head of safety let us do it. I said, mate, this is, it's going to have to change. You know, this this can't happen. 
And at that point, I sort of looked up, and there's there's a guy sort of on these pallet riders, and he's, he's sort of stepping onto the board to get up, and he's like 15 meters in the air, and I just go, no. And he's just go, what's the matter? So like, you can't do that. Brings him back down, and, and I said, look, mate, I said, mate, what's going on? He said, uh, just the way that I was shown. So they've done your training. He said, that guy over there. And so goes and have a conversation. And said, but where's your where's your, your training records and things like that? And, and, I, and, I, and I, I think at this point is when I started going bald. And it was... <laughs> And I remember coming back to the, the office and, and, and sitting down and, and having a conversation with um, the chief operations officer, who was was my boss, and, and he's a Brit as well. And I just I said, "What's happened?" And he just looked at me and he just went, "You've got your work cut out. What do you need?" And yeah, it was it was it was it became it was a really um, intense working relationship with him. I've I've got the utmost respect for him. He was he was a fantastic individual. He's everything that you'd want from a chief operations officer. He would challenge you on everything. He wanted to know everything. Um, you know, I still catch up with him, and and I, and I learned a lot from him um, just by how you you handle yourself and how you approach certain situations and and how much politics. And I did not really realize how much politics goes on in business and that that was maybe being a bit naive and I, I'd, I'd held leadership positions i was just so focused on on delivery um yeah and it was the other and, and this is in my, my first week or so he turned around and said um, we're also about to lose our tri certification and i said what i said that's this is australia like it's impossible to lose he said, yeah, he's the audit report. And I spent the next sort of two days going through this audit report and I was just absolutely mortified and, you know, started talking to people and go, you know, what happened? He was like, oh, you know, we had this person and, you know, they, they got rid of the system and they, they watered it down and they were going to do safety differently. And, and, and I was just like, yeah, like, and it was just like, what were you thinking? You need policies, you need procedures, you need your snapshots in time, you need a meet legal requirements, things like that. And and I sort of I went back to when I first started doing the risk assessments and um, with the council and, and I started talking and it just one of the first conversations I had was with um, one of the like the the admin managers and she just turned around and said it look she said my one bit of advice for you is, is go out and have a conversation when you see people on the grounds and the facilities and just ask them what, what's going to cause harm and, and work back from that. And, you know, that, that sort of stuck with me through all my career. And it was really interesting because all of a sudden it was, you know, taking that focus and, and, you know, the idea of consultation with people in, in this organization was mm -hmm. just up and up. And, you know, so we had to, we had to plug the, the safety differently gap, I'll say. And, and I know it's, it's, it's a very divisive thing, this, this safety differently. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've always said is don't do it differently, just do it properly. Like, have the individual at heart. Mm -hmm. Our job is to look after the people. Um, one of the key principles of it wasn't to treat people as an asset, not a problem to be solved. And yeah. a lot of stuff that I've had back on safety differently, I had a bit of an opinion of it until I started speaking to guys like John Green. He said, we weren't mm. there to rip up and start again. We were there to build on the foundations of what we already had and start yeah. to introduce a new way of thinking. It wasn't about my church is better than your church and we're going to yeah. throw all the old rules in the bin and start again, you know. I and think, I think it, it's been lost somewhere along the lines a little bit in certain aspects, hasn't it? Yeah, look, I think for me it was... It just... There was a lot of people who jumped on the bandwagon mm -hmm. that thought it was it was the golden ticket, it was the answer. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to, um, you know, go to Singapore and Hong Kong and... 
and places across the APAC region. And the good safety leaders for me always have those conversations. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just part of what we do. Yep. Um, and I think what happened with, you know, because it was, it was seen as the Australian thing, a lot of Aussie businesses jumped on it and just, just made their own thing up. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's the individuals who, who came up with this concept, um, either didn't correct it or weren't actively vocal enough to turn around and say, well, you've completely missed the mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where it fell down. Um, but yeah, like, like I say, it's, it's, to me, that's the, just the basic thing. It's, you have that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really interesting. The businesses that I've, I've worked with that have done that safety differently thing, um, they've all ended up with really high um, injury frequency rates, um, massive workers' compensation bills, um, high levels of injuries, um, poor worker engagement. So it's, I think it's just missed the boat. And, and that's one of the things that um, Australia are really good at doing is just missing the mark completely. So... Yeah, like I said, it's 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 not something that I actively, you know, it's 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 certainly not for me. I can understand how it appeals to businesses, but you know, I, I prefer to go look. If you meet a global standard and you do the right things, you're going to meet legal requirements in these areas and and do it that way. And, and obviously, part of certification is demonstrating consultation and mm-hmm. engagement. So it's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, from there, um, a lot of work, um, a lot of, I'd say, stress. It was it was quite, quite a turbulent ride. Um, mm-hmm. We ended up becoming the first business in Australia and New Zealand to be ISO forty five thousand and one certified through Bureau Veritas, right. which was a massive win for the organisation. Like, yeah. If if you're going to scream and shout about something. That's, That's the time. one of the things you shout about, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and, and I'm a massive advocate of, of 45,001. I, I think it adds so much value. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of things that you, we can improve on. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's, it's a fantastic starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, the, I, I had a conversation with the, the CEO. Um, so my my boss had left the business, um, and the CEO just said, "Oh, look, you know, we're paying you mega bucks." And I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "Do you think you've added value?" I said, "Well, you know, I've, I've dropped your your LTI rate from high twenties down to eight. Your injuries have reduced by seventy percent. You've got certified." Your call, and he just said, "Oh yeah, um, we're going to make you redundant." And I just went, "No," and, and it sort of just—I I can remember thought of it, thinking through the contract in the back of my mind, and um, and I'm thinking, "Happy days, <laughs> make me redundant." <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and so they give you the NDA, and you, you sign your life away, and um, you sort of, and it, it was really good because I um I. I I'd pulled my holidays together. So I said, oh, well, this is the day that you're going to end. And I said, well, actually, I'll put my leave in. So I'll have that. And then we were going away. So I think we, um, I left the business on the, the 8th of March, I think it was, um, 2018. And we, uh, we flew to the Maldives on the 9th on my birthday, which was great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and then sort of like the last... Um, the last couple of years, um, back into consulting, so uh, got asked to help the business again in the telco space, setting up the, the risk management. So looking at everything from from a certification perspective, mm-hmm. um, and it was really interesting because they, again, they were another business that had been on this safety differently journey, and then they stopped, and then other things had happened that they, they flexed up in some areas. They separated health and safety from an operational perspective and crammed it into HR. And um, I can remember sort of, I'd been there a couple of months and, and said to them, oh, look, 
you've um, your business continuity plans haven't been updated since early 2000 and you've got this pandemic plan that you know basically says that if there's a pandemic you're going to do a deep clean once a week I said should that if should that not be happening anywhere and uh, there was an associate director of HR and she said Australia doesn't get hit by pandemics and I said all right why she said because we're the lucky country and it doesn't matter what happens it'll never happen to us and um there was a guy who who was and like I said I was a consultant I was there I just this is what you need to do this is what you need to fix this is how we fix it and there was a guy in the health and safety team and he just sort of put his hands in his head and he started shaking and he went we've got bushfires at the moment you know it's you know, we've got people going out on the sites and, you know, the, the, the fires are literally 500 metres away from the building and we're trying to keep the services on. We're not that lucky. And her response was, yeah, but no one's died. And, and that sort of, that mentality, that, that line of sight has, for me, that, that summed up working in Australia. Mm -hmm. that no one's died. And... You know, you then get into the realms of, of, well, actually, a lot of people die. Um, you know, I mean, I think uh, I've done a, I've done a talk the other year um, for the the NSCA Foundation, <clears throat> and and they're like, they're a bit like Ayush in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some some really good people who who, who work for the NSCA. You know, but they just they just don't have the weight. Of, of Irish, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Do do some partnerships with Irish and, and and that's been been amazing. But I was doing um I've been really active with them because I'm the type of person that goes to a conference and you know you tend to see the same people sort of like everything is it's, it's like the Lego movie, everything's awesome. And and you go you well it's not and you sort you look at you know the UK's came, and, and you know, by by so many standards, being involved with with Europe and 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 driving to that that best practice model. You know, I think the UK's um, deaths per hundred thousand workers are it's around about 0 0.4 per hundred thousand at the moment. And you know, and you compare that to 10, 15 years ago, that's a massive movement. Mm -hmm. But then you know, the UK have got this workforce of around. 32, 35 million. And you go, do you know what? That's a good effort. We can do better, you know. And then you look at Australia and you know they've got 12 and a half million people between the ages of 25 and 64 working. And the fatality rate's at about 1.4 per 100,000. And, you know, you ask that question, like, how is it this bad? And, and there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of Australian safety professionals that will go, it's not, it's fine. You know, we're not that bad. You know, we're, we're segregated as a, as a country. So you've got your, your regulator in, in the ACT and in, in Victoria and South Australia. And, you know, everyone's got their own thing. And then there's this federal legislation. And you go, why don't you just have one, one piece of legislation and one, one head of a regulator? to drive that change because you're killing people on a daily basis. And, and I flagged this with, um, in, in, in this session that I've done. And, you know, I, I called out the regulators and I said, you know, you know, when you've got the head of Safe Work Australia who produces the code of practices, earning, you know, the best part of $380,000 a year, £210,000 a year. And we were still, you know, there was a, 180 people die last year at work. And, you know, they're, they're quite content to sit there and tell you that everything is fine. And it's not. And, you know, it's, it's all of a sudden you just, you, you, you snowball into this, what on earth am I doing here sort of thing. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's been massively challenging. I think, um, again, I've been really lucky that, um, you know, I, 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 I have got stressed, like really stressed with, some of the way that the businesses that I've worked with and operated with have, have done business and operated. And, you know, you do feel as though you're, you're the lone, 
you know, the lone gunman sat there trying to do the right thing and it becomes um, quite confrontational to a certain extent and yeah it's but at the same time you know I've, I've learned so much I've, mm -hmm. um, I've grown as a professional um, I've learned to use my network uh, mm -hmm. so and you mentioned it being challenging what's been your biggest challenge so far <coughs> um I think the fact that there's very few safety leaders in Australia, mm -hmm. like I said, I think there's about maybe three or four. Um, and, and, you know, I think, you know, the regular, it seems that the regulators are really comfortable with, with the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, we, we have a poor safety culture here in Australia. It's, it's one of those things where no matter how hard you try, there's that always, it'll be right. It'll be fine. We'll get there. Don't worry. And you go, no, you can't do that. You know, you, you know people are dying. One person dies in Australia to a work related incident every day, statistically. Um, and, and, and that seems acceptable socially. You know, I mean, you, you look at, I mean, I'm a member of the Irish branch in Singapore and, and you know, you see what the Ministry of Manpower have done. And, and, and again, you know, the, they've came on a massive journey. And when you've got the, the PM Lee saying, this is the target, we need to get there. You know, that's, that demonstrates leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I have never heard an Australian MP, political leader, it doesn't matter what side of the fence they're from, um, state or federal, I've never heard them come out and say, you know, last year we killed a hundred and X amount of people. This isn't acceptable. Um, so yeah, it's, it's challenging from that, that perspective. Um, and then, you know, you're so far away from what I call civilization. Um, so it's, it is, it's, it's the back of beyond. It's 15 hours to, to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's, it's nine hours to Hawaii. It's, it's eight hours to Singapore. You know, there's a reason that we've only been back to the UK once in nearly 10 years. And mm -hmm. when I went back to the UK, I ended up with appendicitis. So I was just like, I'm not going back. I can't, I can't afford to lose another body organ. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough one. Um, but you know, I mean, you will, I've learned to rely on my network and I've, I've learned to to have a lot more bottle just to stand up and put myself in the fire online. Um, mm -hmm. And I have got the reputation of, of the whinging pond that fixes, that fixes the, um, the ISO certification issues. Um, and, and I'm, I'm happy to live with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I am very vocal about, you know, we don't do certain things and we don't do things properly. And, and, but I always try and offer a solution. You know, I'm not going to sit there and just go, this is completely broken. You fix it. You know, so I've, I've floated the idea of, you know, the fee for service model that the HSE offer. And, and I know that is, it's massive. It's, it's still very divisive to this day in the UK. Um, but I thought, I think if you had that fee for service model in Australia and you had one regulator and you weren't paying the three or $400,000 for each state head, you know, that's, that's more, that's more inspectors on the ground helping people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I think inspector, there's a lot of inspectors that get a really bad rap. They are, the, you know, the same as the, the, the silent assassins and they're not, they're, they're just doing the job, but it's, again, it's that cultural thing where all the regulators come and everything's got to be spit and span. You know, I, it, one of the, uh, one of the businesses I used to, to, to work with, if they knew I was coming to site, they'd actually bring in a cleaner to clean the warehouse mm -hmm. because it's that perception. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a cultural void. And I think Australia, especially with the pandemic um, and what's happened, you know, I was, um, I was looking earlier on. Um, and even though, you know, Victoria has been in lockdown to a certain extent, New South Wales has had a bit of a lockdown. Brisbane's had a bit of lockdown. Construction has slowed down. Um, they've still, 109 people this year have still died mm. at work. And 
to me, that's that's huge. That's massively confronting. Yeah. But again, it goes back to that point. I just feel it's like it's socially acceptable within Australia mm-hmm. that it's part of work. You run the risk of dying at work, and it's 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 a challenge. Um, but you know, it's it's by talking to people. It's by trying to coach, mentor, educate people. It's it's all the things that get drummed into you when when you have like a mentor mm-hmm. that sort of stick with you and, and, and make you want to try and change the current situation. And again, you know, I mean, you ask an Australian, is it safe? And we go, yeah. And I, and I say, you know, you wouldn't get away with this in Europe or you wouldn't get away with this in the UK or you wouldn't get away with this in Singapore. And we go, yeah, but we're not there. What are you? And it's that, it's that vision, you know, and, and I, and I think for me, that's, that's, I love the idea of vision zero. It's, it's aspirational. You might never get there, but you can set yourself on a journey um, where, you know, like I said, there's a lot of Australian businesses that go, oh, we're going to do zero harm. And then within 24 hours, the, someone's putting a Band-Aid on the finger because they've done something. And it's blown the idea out of the water. You know? you rather, I'd rather have a vision and strive for something and fail than set myself up for failure straight away. And I think there's a lot of that mindset um, that unfortunately happens. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And I think, you know, there's, there'll be a lot of people who watch this that go, nah, doesn't happen. Never happens in Australia. Um, but you know, the, the, the numbers don't lie. You know, there's, there's been over three and a half thousand people die at work since 2003, 2004 in Australia. Mm-hmm. You know, put that into context, during the Battle of Singapore, there was over three and a half thousand people died. And that was a war. That was a conflict. You know, that it's, it's, it's trying to show people that, you know, life's valuable and, and it's a struggle. And I think because they don't have safety reporting into the chief operations officer or the CEO or uh, the chief risk officer. The, the Aussie mentality is to have it in HR because mm-hmm. you can't have a difficult conversation. You know, you can't tell someone off for being unsafe. Um, and, and they've watered that down. So it, it's, I think those are the biggest challenges. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, you keep on fighting on. It's it's yeah, something that you you've just got a you've got a passion about it, mm-hmm. you know. And, and like I said, people, like, I might not want to go for a beer with you after work, but I want you to be able to go home and see your family and your friends. Mm-hmm. So don't take it personal. We're doing this for you. Um, so would yeah, you so recommend a move out to Oz then for anybody watching? Because it's one of those places that is so <clears> the lifestyle that. You're at the beach all the time, it's warm, it's sunny, it's everything that the UK isn't. Would you recommend it for any health and safety professionals watching? I'd never, I'd never say don't come. Um, I would say that they are 30 years behind the rest of the world. And it's sort of the challenges that I first experienced um, seem to be just on the horizon from a safety profession. So it's, look, it's, Australia's amazing. It's been fantastic for us. We've, we're, we're settled to an extent. Um, it's a great lifestyle. You know, the sun's always out. It's never cold, even though I've caught a cold and bronchitis. Um, but it is, if you are in certain professions, there is a, a glass ceiling that you will quickly hit. And they're very good at marketing. Um, that, that, you know, we do this and we do this properly. And it's a tough one. Like I said, I'd, I'd always say to people, come and try it. It's, um, but it is massively challenging. It's, I found it quite stressful. Um, and... You know, and I think to me that's why, you know, 
working from home and doing consulting through the pandemic and 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 that type of stuff has been great because you can just drive for a goal and, and I think for me you know you, you start looking at your next steps in your career and so and I, I've had a couple of conversations with with businesses outside Australia and and it's been quite challenging because they see Australia as sort of like where where compliance goes to die and these are recruiters you know so and I, and I know Jimmy Quinn said you know when um you know, he, there was that stigma about the UAE, you know, that if you can't make it in the UK, you go to the UAE. And it's absolutely rubbish because I know so many people who've worked in in that environment and have been massively successful and have made a massive difference. Yeah, and I think that mindset now is transitioning to Australia. And yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, it's, you've got to find that. And I think for me, it's, it's one of the big things is you I've needed to learn how to pick the right fights mm. rather than picking every battle. So mm. I think it's, it's, it's a tough one. And, and that's part of my continuous learning and my development. And, you know, I'll only get better at that. Um, but I, I certainly won't apologize for being me and, and trying to make sure that people go home. And I think that that's confronting for, for some businesses. And again, I can live with that. It's, it's whether they can or not. So, yeah, it's, I'd try it. Um, I think that's the best bit of advice I could give you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And one on the advice subject, what advice would you give to someone starting out <coughs> day today? Um, challenge everything. Poke mm -hmm. the bear. Keep on learning. You know, you don't have to be an academic. You know, just... Do as many training courses as you can. Speak to as many people as you can. You know, get involved with your your Irish branch. You know, broaden, get, see as much of your network as you possibly can. Um, and for people like me who are not academic, you know, I, I went through the vocational training route, so I've got my MVQ level three. I've done my MVQ level six. Mm -hmm. I've got my lead auditor's qualification. I've done my Irish training. Certificate. I, I, I do all that stuff because you've got to keep on learning. And you know, one of one of my challenges is you know I'm going to go and study a masters. I'm studying a masters. Um, then that's this is going to be like the first bit of proper academia that I've been exposed to, and it's because it's that idea of you don't have to sit an exam and bash it out. Mm -hmm. It's all that portfolio, the evidence building, the opinion, and it's it's for my own development as well as that how how I shape, you know, the next step of my career by putting myself in an extremely uncomfortable environment um, and trying to learn something different and, mm -hmm. and trying to formulate that. So I'd, I'd say, you know, learn as much as you can, you mm -hmm. know, expand your network and don't be afraid. You, you've got to dive into this head on. So, and, and enjoy it because it is an amazing career. It's an amazing profession. It's an amazing vocation. You know, you, you, you look at some of the stuff that, you know, I've been able to personally achieve and I would have never thought that some snotty nosed little kid from Middlesbrough would be living in Sydney, you know, leading businesses on safety strategies and things like that. It's, so personally, it's been great for me, um, but it's like everything, you know, you'll, you'll get out of it what you put into it. Um, mm -hmm. Just, just then, just try to win, try to enjoy it, um, which, which is interesting. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks for the advice as well, Andy. Really appreciate you coming on the show. If people want to follow Andy on LinkedIn, <laughs> look him up. Some of his posts are absolutely brilliant. You'll have a great laugh if anything. They'll brighten up your day. So thanks very much on behalf of the listeners and viewers, Andy. Really appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you very much, mate, for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and, you know, I hope that the podcast keeps on going because I love listening to it and it's fantastic. And, Brilliant. yeah, Brilliant. thanks for having me, mate. It's been thanks awesome. Great feedback. Brilliant. Cheers, Andy. Thanks, mate. This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group. 
the specialists in high-risk and challenging filming and time-lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction and infrastructure projects nationwide.